Bom, vamos começar então a, os nossos questionamentos. Eu gostaria de pedir para quando vocês, quem quiser fazer algum, alguma questão para o stand, só levanta a mão, eu levo o microfone até você, só se apresenta, diz de onde você é, tá? e, e a gente já leva. Pode fazer ou em inglês ou em português, a gente está com a tradução, não tem problema nenhum, que você se sentir mais confortável. Sejam fortes. Acho que Celso, Celso sempre assim. Está bem ensaiadinho, Celso. Muito obrigado, Stan, pela apresentação. Eu gostaria que você falasse um pouquinho. Nós entendemos o contexto dessa organização e diversas possibilidades de de trabalhar o ecossistema da informação para essa grande empresa. Mas talvez fosse interessante falar para como aqui no, no, nosso, no público hoje nós temos muitos designers e informação que estão estudando design ou que já estudaram. Acho que seria importante falar um pouco como a equipe o, o, que você liderou esse trabalho junto a essa empresa como que funcionava esse time? Qual, qual era o papel de um designer né? ou do, de, de uma equipe de design junto a essa organização? Como funcionava? Porque é, 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 trata-se de um problema de, de informação, de, de organizar, de propor novas soluções de como a informação pode navegar no interior dessa dessa organização, assim como para o exterior também, junto aos seus clientes. E qual, qual é o papel, o nosso papel, como nós, designers, ou essa equipe multidisciplinar que trabalha nesse projeto, como pode contribuir? Obrigado, oh, Celso. Um, over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, I've increasingly begun to work in interdisciplinary ways. Um, so at this point in my life, I have about 200 different people as co-authors on academic papers with me, representing about 18 different disciplines. So I'm heavily invested in this idea of, of working across uh, multiple types of specialization. But on every team possible, I try to have at least one, or in this case, several uh, design researchers. And part of the reason is that designers have a tendency to take an interest in the, in the larger context of what's going on. They very seldom will come in and work at just a, a specific level. At least the graduate students in design um, have this tendency of saying, well, we need to know more about the people that are involved. We need to know more about the uh, other partners on our research team. So and to encourage that, um, I, I do a couple of things. One is I've got people on the team from all different levels. So I've got, you know, senior professors that are in the officially in the hierarchy higher than I am. I've got uh, undergraduate students that come in as volunteers. I've got master's students that are only around for a couple of years or a summer. And then I've got my PhD students that'll be there typically four or five years and are often using these projects as the uh, case studies towards their the theorizing that they're doing in their dissertation. Then to get them all working together, I bring them all into the the room and we more or less um, allow that group to strategize about how we're going to address the research questions. So I've set up the sort of policy of the project by saying, you know, here's the three or four things we're going to look at. We're going to go to this major furniture manufacturer and we're going to talk about their information ecosystem. That's already established. Now, how do you think we should go about doing that? And then one of the PhD students will say, you know, I think what we need to do is some interviews and some observations. You know, I've been spending a lot of time on those kinds of things. I've got 10 years of experience. Why don't you let me take charge of that? We'll start to plan out the kinds of things we need to ask and what kind of information we're going to gather and how we're going to go through the analysis. So that was what would happen in the case of um, Amanda. 
who is one of our students interested in um, community capacity building. How does an organization get better uh, through the design intervention? And then we have students like Peter, who is primarily a theorist, but he's very interested in this notion of the semiotic morphism and designers creating meaning. So while Amanda comes in, she's interested in user study and what can be learned. Peter's interested in this more theoretical end. So we do a literature review of 18 different topics and Peter does 11 of them. You know, he's, it's, it's impossible to stop him from going out and reading more on every topic that you, you bring up. So when you're, uh, when you're talking to Peter about some task that he's going to do, you don't say, oh, you know, ignore the previous literature and let's focus on this. You say, while you're in the previous literature, make sure you share what you're finding with the rest of us. So that's the second principle. Only as the manager established the policy, let, let people choose as much as possible. In, they'll, they'll invest themselves in uh, leading or planning or carrying out the parts that are, that are in, of interest to them. And then the, the, um, the, um, the flip side of that coin is don't ask them to do things that they won't naturally be doing. Ask them to do the thing that you can't stop them from doing anyway and make that a benefit to the project. So in the case of um, one of my master's students, Claire, we can stop her from doing designs. You know, she could care less about the previous literature that Peter is so invested in, but she, you know, she's immediately starting down to do information, interaction, planning. She's drawing sketches. So that becomes her role on the project. Then we've got um, uh, someone like Ji-hun, quite far into her dissertation, um, interested in, she calls them ambient information systems. So, you know, if this is a smarter object than it is, or this table has some instrumentation in it so it knows what's sitting on it, or it knows where it is in relation to other things in the room. And I've got, you know, my cell phone, so I'm bringing some extra computing capacity into the room. And the room itself has sensors. So there, we're in an instrumented environment. You've got some human beings. You've got some devices with intelligence. Given that sort of a premise, what is the best practices for the designer to follow? That's Ji Hun's interest. So that relates in a variety of ways, both within this organization and, you know, at the supply chain level and at the dealerships and at the customers, um, because they're increasingly producing these kinds of smart objects. And it's useful for them to know um, both how to, how to go about the process of creating them in the first place and then also of deploying them. So she's just one student in a, in a PhD program, but she's got some very good ideas about, what would you call it, the methodological structure that needs to be in place for that kind of planning. So in her case, I don't send her out to the client site. I don't ask her to do any design. I ask her to pursue this idea of the ambient information system and apply that thinking then into the uh, future opportunities that we're proposing to that organization. Much as you and I did with the uh, future scenario work. We were really a little preemptive doing it in the spring because that part of the project happens in November. But now we've already done a whole bunch of it. so. You know, we get this extra advantage from, from having had you and your expertise and your research interest there and being willing to be a part of that larger ecosystem of people. The other thing I find is that uh, by having these various, you know, professors, postdocs, PhDs, masters, undergraduates all in the same room and all working on the same team, is that they will, they will naturally form working groups if I encourage it. Um, so I didn't assign the analysis of our observational data to anybody. We all just knew it had to be done and the people that were interested in it got together and started doing it. And then as a project manager for me it's always management by exception. So as long as things are running well I let them run, check in periodically. Uh, but I only really take an active role with an individual part of the project when there's something going sideways. So there's some difficulty that's arisen. People need to have some feedback on how best to store the data that they're getting out of the analytical processes, for instance. Then they'll come and grab me and say, you know, help. So I need to, I need to let the team know that that's, that's an opportunity for them. 
In this case, too, we did something that we haven't typically done before with the, the industry half of the research team. So I've got about eight or ten people probably in my in my school, but we've also got another seven, six or seven people at the at the company, which is their head offices aren't even in Chicago. They're in a different city altogether. So they have a... Um, what do they call them, wormholes or telepresence rooms, right, where you can sort of sit and there's a large set of screens that that the people on the other side are, or they're sitting in front of a large set of screens, so it's as though you're on, it's as though you're sharing a boardroom table. Um, and we've met with them weekly so that their research activities, as much as possible, converge uh, with the ones that we're doing at the school. So we get a kind of a weekly update and a weekly planning session for what's going to come next. Those meetings tend to be a little bit unstructured. We'll just say, you know, what's the most important thing we need to decide today? And that's the two or three things that we talk about. And similarly, uh, on my teams, I, I don't typically have regular meetings uh, because it's by exception as long as everyone is kind of keeping everyone else informed, you know, as they will normally at the water fountain. Um, I, I dislike the idea of getting everybody in a room so that they can all say, I did my job this week. How about you? Oh yeah, I did mine. And you? Oh yeah, I did mine too. All right, well, time for lunch. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's not particularly a productive use of what for me are very rare resources. You know, to have the time of those students is a, a precious commodity for me, so I try to make the maximum advantage of it. So those are four or five. I don't know if that's a kind of an adequate answer to your question. Okay, great. Usually the question I get is, why are you so good looking and also intelligent? <laughs> but, uh, and I, I really don't have an answer. I credit my mother. Hi, <laughs> Stan. Uh, should I ask in English or Portuguese? Okay. Uh, how do, do you see uh, the data visualization uh, 20 years from now? I mean, what's the future? <laughs> I know it. I think what we've seen in the last 10 years is increasing um, evidence of data visualization in the culture. People are getting more and more educated to use it. So if you look at Google, you've got their Ngram viewer. You know, you can look for patterns of words appearing across time across their whole uh, body of organization. Or if you look at um, the New York Times, uh, almost every week they've got some information graphic or information visualization that um, communicates so much more clearly and quickly uh, than it w than would be possible with just a uh, written text. Um, the linearity of text is something that we've thought about a lot and it's good for sort of a complex understanding that builds over time. But it's a terrible way of describing something where you want an overview. So imagine um, describing a map just using words. You want to convey all the information on the map, but you're going to do it verbally. It's almost impossible. You know, It would take a very complex mind to even understand what you're getting at. Whereas a map, uh, with a little bit of training, becomes a fairly intuitive information object. So one of the things we're hoping for the future is increased use of information visualizations as an underlying structured surface like a map, where if you think of the map, it's information itself, but then I want to know where are, all the, where are all the restaurants in Porto Alegre. So I take a bunch of pins and I stick them all over the map. So I've got one layer of information, and then in order to make my argument or to to understand a, a research question, I have this additional layer of information stuck in. So in this, um, in this vision of using information visualizations, you replace the map with something else. It might be a target diagram, it might be a, a game board, it might be anything that is a, a meaningful structure of the surface. And then you can carry out your various interpretive processes by what you superimpose as the next layer of information on that map. So we had one design, for instance, that showed uh, the various countries of the world, 
and their size was dependent on how many tweets they made coming out of that country. And then superimposed on that were these sort of clouds of bees that flew from country to country as you changed the time scale, and those were the trending topics. So something that's exciting in Brazil today might be exciting in uh, USA tomorrow. It doesn't get to Canada until the end of the week. You know, you can kind of watch those sorts of patterns happening. So that does two things. It, it gives you a richer layer, uh, this layering idea gives a, a richer kind of information, a more interpretive kind of information, and one that's um, amenable to change, uh, watching the changes over time. I don't know if you guys look at uh, Hans Rosling's work uh, where he shows the changes in international health statistics over time, right? And he kind of, you, you almost need him there to explain it as it's happening. You can go and set up your own on the Gapminder site, but if you watch his TEDx talks, it's like he's commenting a football game or something, you know? And, you know, the individual income is rising, and that it correlates over here with the... You know. So that's... Um, uh, another sort of interesting and exciting thing is the possibility of a third layer of interpretive information on the dynamic information that's already moving. And I think uh, we're already seeing an increasing amount of that kind of interpretive commentary, um, even in places like the New York Times. So I don't know if I'm getting 20 years into the future. Um, one of the things that will happen is more data available. Right. So big data comes from uh, small samples of instrumented environments. Right now we don't know uh, the details of how all of you have been sitting in these chairs throughout the lecture. A few years from now that will be just routine information. We'll, we'll know, you know, were you comfortable, were you shifting your weight a lot, were you sleeping? That will all be available to the whoever is looking at the, the data coming out of the chairs. If you look right now at the uh, the engine of a Boeing 747, it collects several terabytes of data about its own performance on every flight. And all they do with it is they, they pull it out at the end of the flight and, and run their diagnostic processes to make sure everything's okay, and then they throw it away. So as storage increases, there will be less of that throwing away too. There will be, you know, kind of monitoring across time. And my suspicion is you'll start to find trajectories of, of information that lead to some kind of conclusion that you can get just because you've been able to track, you know, what has been the previous activity of the thing. Particularly with human beings. We think of ourselves as moving uh, fairly uh, freely throughout the world. Uh, and we do that to a certain respect as individuals. Um, but if you're aggregating the quantified self of a whole group of people, uh, you'll start to see patterns that emerge across across behavior. Um, one of the things I always say is I'm looking forward to the day, some people object, they say, well, it's kind of an invasion of privacy that technical organizations are keeping track of me and how I behave and what I buy and what I search for. But in my case, I've I spent a lot of my life in the, in the broadcast uh, marketing era where I was just bombarded with random stuff all the time, right? So, I could walk down the street and I'm getting diaper commercials. Well, the only children I'm involved with are in their 20s now. The last thing I need is information about diapers. Um, I've got a whole range of different topic areas that are like that, right? I just, it's not anything to do with me. So the next, the future that I, uh, you know, sort of a utopian future for me is I'm only bombarded or I'm only presented with things that I'm actually interested in. So that's a help, and maybe throw in some random ones once in a while so that I can expand my interests, but uh, you know, at least allow me to remove the ones that, that are um, distasteful to me or uninteresting to me or whatever. And then the next generation of that is the point where every day is Christmas. So I just give the companies a budget. Here's my money for the month. Every day send me something I want. And then I don't have to worry about making decisions at all. I can just accept the, the organizational profiling that's been set up for me. And especially because they're all, they will do what they're already doing, which is figuring out how to encourage me to want something, so they can do both. And it takes a lot of the uh, load off my plate. The um, President of the United States has said in an interview that his most precious resource is decision making. 
so he tries to eliminate all of the trivial decisions that he makes in a day because he's got to also make the decisions about, you know, will there be a war or will we deploy this amount of money over here versus there or, you know, whatever those top level executive decisions are. Um, and if he spent a bunch of time worrying about what pair of shoes he's going to buy or, you know, how he should get his hair cut, that's uh, time that hasn't been spent in the most optimal way. So it's a bit of a joke, but at, by the same token, I can see, um, I can see the potential uh, for some benefit along those lines. I don't know if any of you know the book, um, uh, what is it called, the Choice Paradox, the Decision Paradox, something like that. A recent interesting study of uh, the problem that's presented when you've got, you know, a thousand things to choose between and they only vary slightly uh, one to another. Um, studies show that uh, you end up buying less. Uh, given so many choices than you do if you've just got a, a small set, you know, under 10. Um, and I think that's something, too, that's going to start to come to people's mind is that we not only want this massive amount of information at our fingertips, we want it deployed in such a way that it's, uh, um, that it's to, our, to our benefit. Like I say, I want to go in and browse for chairs, but really what I want to do is describe how Celso spends his day and I don't have to do the cognitive work of figuring out what I know about how he spends his day should correlate into furniture. The furniture company should be the ones to, that do that for me. So I hope that's something, a couple of things. Oh, one other one I'm working on is timelines. I think the current time, the, the visualization that has like a ruler of time and then you stick events on it is a terrible design. So we've been working for a number of years on incorporating additional kinds of information like uncertainty, perspective, whose timeline is it, um, uh, disagreement, the relationship of one event to another, um, the relationship of the orders of events, what do you do with partial information to fill up full information, what if time is only event and not a kind of a sequential thing. If you think about what you did yesterday, you won't remember every minute equally. You'll remember the two or three kind of key things that you did. Um, so why is the representation of time not along those lines. And one of the most interesting ones for me is the encounter in the present of something that has a timeline in the past. So I'm now, uh, you know, wandering around the world in 2014 and I, f and I only hear of Green Day, you know, some band from the early 90s. Now, uh, they have a whole history that happened before I ever encountered them, but for me they're a brand new thing. So you've got these kind of parallel uh, branches going. And uh, another one is uh, uh, the change about my what I remember and what I predict based on some event that that affects how I understood things. So I understand, oh, someone was lying to me. Oh, well, now I've got to go back and revisit everything they ever said, right, and figure out what that implied. And it's going to change how I think about them in the future. So there's these sort of critical events that that cause a disruption in the timeline. So if you think of, you know, a ruler with points stuck on, there's, I don't know, a handful of things that they don't currently do. And I'm hoping, maybe not 20 years, maybe two or three years, we'll have a, um, some outcome of this research project that'll make that kind of modeling easier and better for people. And if you think as a designer, uh, if you're doing experience design or service design, uh, that kind of modeling could be um, very effective in your work. So this also just reminded me, we've got a project about the turning the sequence of a discussion or a conversation or a presentation or a meeting into a physical object. So instead of a linear record, you get, a, you get an artifact, like a little sculpture that represents everything that everybody said and how they said it. And you can just take that away and for remembering or telling somebody else or analysis. Um, and we've got a project that we've started a couple of years ago that we're we're doing that kind of modeling and trying to do that kind of automatic capture, um, which I think you know anybody that converses could benefit from that kind of a. So there will be there will be entirely new information objects that we haven't even thought of, like these conversational models.
Hello, Stan. Uh, I'm an industrial engineering, and I'm taking my master's in knowledge transfer between cross-functional, uh, multifunctional knowledge. And uh, every time you say something about uh, interpreting information or uh, exchanging experience, I hear knowledge. I don't know if there's something right. And maybe if, uh, do you think about uh, taking your research on this on this way about that because transferring knowledge is a little bit more complex than transferring information and I don't know if you have something in mind or thinking about that yeah so the distinction there is between data information that has no essential interpretation applied to it and knowledge, which is information that I've somehow contextualized or or interpreted in such a way that I can now I can now understand it. So an example I sometimes give is the um, in the literary community if you read I don't know how many of you know Shakespeare's play The Tempest. It's a story of a father and a daughter. They're stranded on an island together and they the daughter grows up just under the education of the father until finally uh, the father who is kind of all powerful arranges for a ship to crash with his uh, problems from his past are on board that ship and then they resolve those problems. So that's the flat almost data level or naive level reading of the play The Tempest. If you approach it from the interpretive perspective of a feminist, somebody who's interested in the roles of women in society, it's a kind of a horror story because the daughter uh, has never met another human being. She's only ever dealt with her father and with the witch and her son that they took the island from. So as far as she knows, the world is only populated by, you know, this, this all-powerful man, her father, the monster, and this woman that they killed. That's her entire experience until this ship shows up. So when she first encounters the other people, she says that famous phrase, oh, what a brave new world that hath such people in it. Right? Because she's seen for the first time human beings and thinks, oh, they're wonderful. And of course, they're a bunch of, you know, they've got a lot of problems. But she doesn't see that right away. So uh, reading it through the eyes of Miranda, The Tempest is a completely different play. Or if you read it as a post-colonialist, well, what on earth happened? There were people who lived on the island, the witch and her son, who were killed and put into slavery. Caliban is his Prospero slave, right? and Caliban knows it. He's like, oh, the days when I ran this island myself, you know, and I didn't have to work for you. Or the, the airy sprites, the same, there's these sort of supernatural creatures around, and Prospero has also enslaved them, right? They're just, they do whatever he tells them. And one of the improvements at the end of the thing is he lets them all go. Oh, I'm going to go back to Padua, and I can... You know, the island can go back to the situation it was in before. So there again, suddenly, what the heck? You know, it's a completely different play because I bring this new interpretive lens into it. And I think one of the, well, two of the things that we can think about in terms of knowledge is how do we design to encourage people to bring a new interpretive lens into the material? So there might be a way of thinking about, you know, products and services that we haven't thought about before. And then second, how can we capture and re-communicate uh, those interpretations so that they're a benefit to the next group of people? So in the literary, I mean, if you're a professor in an English department or in a literary studies department, that's what you've got at your fingertips is the feminist reading, the post-colonial reading, the queer reading, the reading as a new historicist, right? There's two dozen of these interpretive lenses that have been developed over time, and each time they're applied, you learn something new about the thing that you've been reading. So it's not, um, it's not that we solve the problem of Shakespeare and then move on to Milton. Right? It's a completely different way of understanding the world. We, we take the object of study and we enrich it by looking at it from these different perspectives. And that's a, a stance that half the world has used, the humanities half of the world, that has been deprecated now for the last 20, 30 years in preference to the, the scientific way of viewing the world, which is you are advancing knowledge by taking paired hypotheses and proving one or strengthening the case for one over another. 
So that's a completely different kind of knowledge. And I think it tends to be more the one that we think about when we think about knowledge. We think about sort of scientific knowledge as opposed to humanities knowledge. And I think there's a strong role for design in, in uh, encouraging people to have this other approach to, to everything that isn't science, which is almost everything. Uh, that we need multiple interpretations in order to understand it more thoroughly. You don't really get all the benefit you can out of reading The Tempest until you've also read it as a feminist and as a post-colonialist and as a, you know, one of these other interpretive strategies. So yeah, so the invention of new strategies and the recording and communication of, of what those interpretations have been. And you know, I mean, you have to be a literature professor to know about all these interpretations, right? That has to be your specialty, your area of study to have collected them. And typically you're only really interested in one or two rather than the whole group. So even in that case, it's not perfect. So how do we get that, that kind of knowledge uh, available to everyone rather than just these, uh, these specialists dealing with specialist objects of study, right? I can equally well have a variety of interpretive lenses onto my room design and I think I'll end up with a better room design at the end of it.